This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Well, let, let me begin by reassuring the audience that we are going to steer clear of quantum electrodynamics tonight. <laughs> We're going to stick, as, as, as uh, Mr. Dyson said, nothing that needs a blackboard. Uh, so we're going to stick to topics that, quite frankly, uh, are understandable to those of us who spent our college years studying Wordsworth and the Lake Poets. So <laughs> we're not going to, to, to dive too deeply into uh, theoretical f physics. But let me begin, if I could, uh, Mr. Dyson. Uh, when it comes to nuclear armaments, you have been described as a civil heretic. So let's start with that topic. It sounds like an intriguing place to begin. Um, Barack Obama and Dmitry Medvedev recently agreed to cut the strategic nuclear arsenals of, the, of Russia and the United States from uh, 2,200 warheads to 1,500. Uh, and with the end of the Cold War, it seems to me that the nuclear threat certainly has receded from the consciousness of the world. Aren't we much safer today, or should we still be worried about a nuclear exchange? Well, we are much safer, but we still should be worried. That's, of course, the point, that this danger is still by far the biggest danger we have to worry about, and it's very largely disregarded. And uh, we have to make much more drastic reductions if it's ever to make any real sense. I mean, this reduction that is just being talked about at, at the moment is just a token. It really doesn't make much difference whether you're hit by 2,200 warheads or by 1,500. That's far too many. And we should be talking about reductions to zero or to pretty close to zero if it's really to make a substantial difference. In addition to all that, as the, 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 the numbers themselves are misleading because there is what they call the active stockpile and the inactive stockpile. In which, so the active stockpile is the weapons that are actually deployed, ready to, 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 to be aimed and, and, and exploded. And the inactive stockpile are those that are in reserve. And they're about equal in size. So that at the moment, the, if you add in all these inact, the inactive stockpile, it's more like 5,000 than 2,000. After the uh, reduction, it, it will still be 3,500 3, 3, or whatever it may be. So you, uh, it's not as small, the numbers are not as small as they look. And they're still much too big. Well, does intent not make a difference here, at least when it comes to the US government and the Russian government? I mean, it seems to me war today between, the Soviet, between Russia and the United States seems almost unthinkable, unlike during the Cold War. That's true, but on the other hand, things are, can happen which, are, which nobody intends. We can, we can make stupid mistakes, lots of us do, and uh, th there's absolutely no guarantee this is not going to be a disaster, and even if we're well-intentioned. And of course, not everybody is all the time well-intentioned. As, as someone once said, we, we trust the British and we trust the French. Well. We sort of trust the French. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, President Obama is the first president in post-war history, the first president in history, I'm, I'm fairly confident, to ever speak of eliminating nuclear weapons. Not true. Okay. I mean, Reagan was straight. much stronger. Than Reagan really wanted to eliminate nuclear weapons, and he talked with Gorbachev about that very seriously. So that, in fact, he was far more of an abolitionist than Obama. And it's, it's true in general that uh, right-wing Republicans have been the most effective in getting rid of weapons, largely because when they do it, they don't get attacked by right-wing Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> so in fact, there have been three right-wing Republican presidents, uh, Reagan, who talked very seriously about abolition, and almost got there. I mean, he and, and Gorbachev 
were almost at the brink of, of, of agreeing to abolish weapons totally. And then they, they had these, of course, both on both sides, they had conservative advisors who were horrified by the idea, so it's talked, who talked them out of it. But um, anyway, they got pretty close. Uh, the other two who were even more successful, or much more successful, were Reagan, uh, were, were Nixon and George Bush Sr. It's not widely known, but we should be proud of those two gentlemen. Nixon did what I thought was by far the most effective disarmament move in, in the last century. He got rid of our biological weapons totally with a stroke of the pen. And, and that's the right way to do it, in my opinion. I think international negotiations are very helpful, and international negotiations, which is what the route Obama is taking, can be effective, but they're very, very slow. You have to, all the time, you have to deal with minute details, which people take, uh, opponents of an agreement will take advantage of. And of course, you have to have it ratified by the Senate if it's in the United States. That's a painful and, and, and laborious process. So it means that, in fact, if you really want to have a serious move toward disarmament, you far better do it unilaterally, which is what Nixon did. So he simply said, we'll get rid of our weapons, period, destroy the stockpiles, dismantle the research programs, and, and, and that was done in one afternoon. And then he started then negotiating with the Russians to turn it into a treaty. And, and, and uh, of course, the Russians signed the treaty and then cheated. It was a long history. But where the, 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 the abolition of biological weapons has been, I would say, an enormous step forward, even though the other side cheated. I'm far more safer in a world without our weapons, even if the other people hang on to them. So anyway, second historical fact is that George Bush Sr. got rid of more nuclear weapons than anybody else in history, and that was also done unilaterally. So he decided to get rid of all the tactical nukes, which included everything the army possessed. The army was completely denuclearized and the surface navy. They, both the army and the surface navy, had, they, between them, had about half of all the nuclear weapons. And they were abolished just overnight. And again, they had after that, uh, this, this was in 1991, in sort of the closing months of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union, in fact, followed, more or less followed suit. They haven't got rid of all of theirs. And we, and we don't. In fact, we didn't get rid of all of ours because the Air Force hung on to a few. But still, it was a major move toward nuclear disarmament. And I think to, to, to do something serious, Obama has to do something like that. Just negotiating numbers down a little bit is not enough. Well, if Obama decided to unilaterally abolish strategic nuclear weapons, the whole ICBM, uh, you know, submarine-launched missiles, et cetera, uh, would that not create a dangerous uh, asymmetry? Would it, would it not leave the United States somewhat vulnerable to, to a, a new Soviet regime that might, uh, you know, uh, use nuclear weapons to, for blackmail? Of course it would. I mean, the, whatever you do is dangerous. It's just a question of balancing risks. And no, of course it's risky. And of course he won't do it until uh, he's had his re-election and, and, and is at the end of his second term. <laughs> but there's a chance he might then. And well, let me, let me continue to play the devil's advocate. I mean, the, the old theology of, of arms control, certainly in the, in the 80s when I was hanging around the Pentagon a little bit, was that it would not be desirable to eliminate nuclear weapons altogether because if there were no nuclear weapons, and it, it's certainly debatable whether you could literally eliminate them all, but if you could, that you would leave the world safe for conventional war again, as it was in 1939, that nuclear weapons do have a deterrent value. So address that issue, if you would. Yeah, of course it's true that the nuclear weapons are 
a way of preventing other kinds of wars. And it's just, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a delicate balance whether you want them or not. I, I think, in fact, as in the world as it is now, we are obviously better prepared and, and better positioned to fight a non-nuclear war than we have been for quite a long time. And uh, our strength is really in non-nuclear weapons. The Russians have more reason, actually, to hang on to their nukes because it gives them the status of a great power. So there's, there are all sorts of considerations. I'm not saying that the nuclear weapons didn't have any value, but simply it's time to think hard as to whether we really need them. Well, if, the, and again, going back to the old theology, if you went down to a minimal deterrent force, which would be something around 500 warheads, used to be what people talked about, uh, does that make any sense to you, or does that just leave the world a far too dangerous place and that it would be better to eliminate, at least eliminate strategic warheads altogether? Well, in my opinion, it's the sort of, the, 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 it's, it's rather like the burning coal in, in, in China and India, which is, it's a similar situation in a way. I mean, that China and India absolutely need to burn a lot of coal in order to get rich, and they're, they're going to do that. And, but it's, it's a temporary expedient. We all know it would be much nicer to, to switch to solar energy right away, but we don't know how to do it. It's, and I would say it's nuclear weapons are rather like coal, that they're very helpful for keeping the peace for 50 or 100 years. But in the long run, we've got to get rid of them for the same reason we have to get rid of coal. I mean, that if you go on and on long enough, you, you run into, into real bad trouble. So it's time to start thinking whether we haven't reached that point. Well, uh, what about uh, the role of missile defenses, uh, particularly as we continue to cut uh, uh, ICBM-launched warheads? Uh, do missile defenses make any sense to you? Well, it's a problem, of course, with missile defenses that they make sense politically, but they don't make sense technically. And, uh, so it's an awkward situation. I mean, uh, the, I think the, it would be a very fine thing if the countries of the world changed their strategy from the offense to the defense. And I think we may come to that. I mean, that if you get the offense down to zero or close to zero, then Missile defenses could really be helpful in giving people confidence and that it would make, they would be a, a force for stability. On the other hand, if you try to deploy missile defenses now, which is what we are doing, they make no, te they make no technical sense at all. They simply don't do the job they're designed to do. And of course, there's been a, 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 a lot of fraud and, and, and deception involved. I uh, had the conviction a long time ago that it would be nice to have missile defenses, but that it was hopeless as long as they were kept secret. And, and that uh, at that time, General Abramson was in charge of the Star Wars program under, Re this was in Reagan's administration. And it happened, I agreed with Edward Teller about this. And so Teller and I went together to the Pentagon and we talked to General Abramson, and Teller, in fact, talked, and I just listened. But um, <laughs> anyway, what Teller said was right, and I agreed with it, that the missile defense would never be technically successful unless it was declassified, brought out into the open, so it could be openly criticized, and you could get then the, the full force of technical opinion helping to push the program along. And the general said, he, of course, oh, he agreed with this completely. In fact, he was just planning to declassify the whole program in the next, in the next week or two. And so he said, I, I'm very happy. I agree with you. There's no problem. And we'll have it all out in the open. Of course, we went away feeling good. And he never did anything of the kind. <laughs> so that's roughly the situation. It's still the situation today. The program is held secret. Its failures are covered up, and uh, everybody knows it doesn't work, but it's still, it's, it, you, can't, you can't prove it because it's classified. So it's a thoroughly, dis, uh, I, I would say, a, a, a useless 
program as far as talking about the, the technicalities are concerned. On the other hand, from a political point of view, in the long run, it probably is helpful. Well, is it technically infeasible today simply because any missile defense system has, is so leaky that it would be overwhelmed by, certainly by a Russian attack? By That's absolutely true. Explain, it, explain that, please. Yes, I mean, the fact of the matter is that the Russians, if they wanted to, could wipe us out with, with uh, 2,000 uh, 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 nuclear missiles. And the best your defense could possibly do, if it really worked as advertised, would be to knock down maybe half of those. So you get, uh, you get clobbered with 1,000 instead of 2,000. That doesn't make all that much difference. The, 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 the cities that you save, that's always been true, cities that you save are those that are not attacked. So in, in the, the defense may still be politically very effective or even save a lot of lives, even if it's technically useless. Because the, 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 the people who are attacking will be conservative. And they will be, want to be sure of destroying one or two high-value targets. So they'll put on too many, being afraid of the defenses, they will put on a, a, a too many missiles on each target. So all the places they don't attack will come out still alive. So that it, it's from that point of view, the, the defense may actually do quite a lot of good, even if it's worthless technically. But of course, the stated rationale of the, Bush, the, the second Bush administration and of now the Obama administration uh, is that the, what is being deployed with potential uh, interceptors in uh, Poland and uh, I guess it's the Czech Republic uh, are really directed against a rogue launch by a, an emerging nuclear power like Iran, that it would. So I, my question is, would, do missile defenses have any value against a much more limited kind of attack that could have come from an emerging nuclear power like North Korea or, or Iran? Well, I would say technically that's possible, but it's uh, not actually helpful in the state of the world as, as it is now. The, uh, the sort of these hypothetical threats that it's supposed to counter don't yet exist, and, and, uh, and the defense is certainly not adequate to deal with them. And, uh, and no, um, I, I would say at the moment they're really not helping anybody, and they're also certainly annoying the Russians. I wouldn't try to defend them. I would say they're not quite as bad as their uh, opponents allege, um, but they're certainly not doing us any good. I, I think the conventional wisdom is that the real nuclear threat today is not, not Russia, but perhaps uh, Pakistan or North Korea or Iran or potential uh, terrorists getting their hands on a nuclear weapon. Now, how, how should the United States be addressing that problem? Well, we've had that problem for, for 50 years. It, it is, there's nothing new about that. I mean, we were worrying about terrorist bombs at least 30 years ago. And the, the danger is still there, and it's not going to go away. But certainly, the danger is worse just because our weapons are, exist and might be stolen. And it is the United States and the Russians who have all these weapons lying around. And so if there are bad guys in, who are intending to steal one or two, we are making it easier for them. But I don't pretend that there's a solution to this problem. I mean, the, the problem of terrorist bombs is going to be with us whatever we do. And it's always possible that some stockpiles are hidden away. I don't see, I don't think it's likely that the Israelis will take kindly to the idea that they destroy all their weapons. And I don't think we should wait for them. Can we realistically put the genie back in the bottle? No. No, absolutely not. And it's something we have to live with one way or another. But I think the, the way we deal with biological weapons is quite 
similar to what one should do with nuclear weapons. I mean, it, we haven't eliminated the, the danger, but we have reduced it considerably. And the fact that all the biological weapons have to be hidden away and not openly deployed, I think is a great help. It means that they're, they are much harder to steal. The popular view, I believe, to raise a different, slightly different subject that you have written about, uh, the popular view is that the atomic uh, bombs uh, dropped on Japan in 1945 brought the war to a swift end, and that in fact not only a lot of allied lives were saved that otherwise would have been lost, but Japanese lives as well. Uh, why did the Japanese surrender in August of 1945? Well, that's a very interesting question because, I mean, well, the, the, first of all, I should say, I mean, there are two separate questions which often get mixed up. There's, the question of why the Japanese surrendered, and there's the question of whether it was right or wrong to bomb Hiroshima, and those are separate questions. Why don't you address them both, please? So uh, I'm, 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 ta I'm talking about why the Japanese surrendered, and I believed, of course, like everybody else at the time, that the bombs ended the war. And, I mean, it was, it was just obvious at the time. I was in the business of bombing I, I was about to fly to Okinawa to supervise a British bomber force which was going to join in the bombing of Japan. So I was just wonderfully relieved to hear what, just the morning of August 6 that the war was over and the bombs had been dropped and that was it. And, and so you naturally assumed that the bombs caused the, the Japanese surrender. And nothing you saw at that time led you to doubt that. And I say all Americans and all British, I think, who were exposed at that time believed that the bombs ended the war. And that has, of course, been, has had a profound effect on, on American thinking, that we think of the nuclear bombs as the key to our own security. And, and only quite recently, I came to the opposite opinion. And I, I came to that opinion mostly because of my friend Sid Drell, who may be in the audience, and uh, who has been campaigning recently for abolishing nuclear weapons. Most of what I know about the subject I learned from him. And uh, anyhow, there's been a lot of serious historical study of why the Japanese surrendered. And it's becoming clearer and clearer as time goes on that, in fact, it wasn't the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that caused them to surrender, but it was the Russian entry into the war. It was the Russian invasion of Manchuria combined with the declaration of war, which happened on the 9th of August. So let me go into the arguments. There's a historian called Tsuyoshi Hasegawa, who has written a book about this recently, it's called uh, Racing the Enemy, I think it's called. And he's gone into the Japanese documents very thoroughly. And a lot of these documents have only recently become available. Anyhow, there's a succession of arguments. I mean, the first thing is that the serious questions in the Japanese government during the war were in the hands of, of, of the Supreme War Council, which consisted of the heads of the army and the air force and the navy and the foreign secretary and I think six people altogether uh, and Lord Privy Seal there was uh, Mar Marquis Kido who was sort of the dove among the collection of hawks and, and uh, so there were these people were supposed to advise the emperor because the emperor made all the final decisions but in fact, he always did what the Supreme Council advised. So it was a sort of a, a unconstitutional monarchy, but in fact functioned like a constitutional monarchy. So anyway, when there was an important decision to make, then the Supreme War Council got together and made the decision. Well, on August 6, Hiroshima was bombed. The Foreign Secretary called for a meeting of the Supreme Council. No meeting was held. It wasn't considered important enough to have a meeting. 
So that was August 6th. On, on, I mean, August 8th, there's a surviving document which re records a conversation between the Secretary of the Navy and his deputy, I think recorded by the deputy, and they discuss the state of affairs. That's August 8th, that's two days after Hiroshima. And the bombing of Hiroshima is barely mentioned. The important question they were discussing was the ration of rice in Tokyo, which was to be reduced by 10%. So it was clear that Hiroshima was not uppermost in their minds. Then came August 9th and the Russians moved into Manchuria. Within six hours, the Supreme Council was in session. So it was clearly, a, just from the timing, it was clearly a response to the invasion, not a response to Hiroshima. And that was the meeting that actually decided to surrender. And during, in fact, it happened during the day that Nagasaki was also bombed. But that, also, that wasn't the cause of the meeting, because it was, discuss it was discussed at the meeting. But the end of the meeting was that it was agreed that Japan should surrender. And then the emperor had to make a proclamation to make it happen, because it was very problematical whether if the emperor orders a, a surrender, whether the army would actually obey. There was some, a lot of people in the army who actually wanted to, to carry on the war and considered it totally dishonorable to surrender. So Hirohito, the emperor, then wrote a rescript which was issued ordering the, the armed forces to surrender. So it was addressed to the leaders of the army and navy and air force. And in this rescript, he explained why he wanted to surrender. And again, the bombs are not mentioned. What it says in that rescript is look at what my grandfather did. His grandfather was the great emperor Meiji, who was held in the highest respect by everybody. Meiji was the emperor who modernized Japan. He was responsible for Japan becoming a powerful state. And he also fought a war against China in 1895. That was the first time the Japanese invaded Manchuria, drove the Chinese out of Manchuria. And then what happened in 1895? The European powers intervened, led by Russia. And of course, there were several other European powers who had enclaves in China at that time. And uh, so they simply marched into Manchuria and drove the Japanese out. And Meiji then surrendered. He accepted the European terms, which the Europeans said, you just clear out of Manchuria. That belongs to China. It doesn't belong to you. So he effectively surrendered to the Europeans. And Hirohito, in his rescript, said, that's what we have to do. It's Today, it's the same as 1895. That's what he said. Essentially, the point was that they surrendered to the Europeans to keep the Russians out of Japan. The effect of the surrender was the Russians left Japan alone. So Hirohito said it's the same today. So I think it's pretty clear that what, what was in his mind was this history of what his grandfather did and wasn't a question of one or two cities being destroyed. The final point which Hasegawa makes is why did the Japanese themselves afterwards say that the bombs caused them to surrender? Which they did. There were quite a number of Japanese who made such statements. And it's fairly clear that there were two reasons why they said that. First of all, for the Japanese military, they wanted 
to claim that they'd been de just defeated by a scientific advance that had nothing to do with military bravery or with military incompetence. So they were not to be blamed. That essentially, the, for the mili military, the surrender was a terrible loss of face, which of course for Japanese is very hard to accept. And so they saved their own faces to some extent by saying we were defeated by science, not by superior military strategy. The other reason why they said that they had surrendered because of the bombs was that was what the Americans wanted to hear, that uh, nobody in America wanted to hear that it was the Russians who caused them to surrender. <laughs> so they wouldn't have, have been particularly anxious to say that. Anyway, that's a long story, but I think it's true. So I have definitely d changed my mind, and I believe, because no, nothing is certain in history, but I think it's at least 90% probable that it was really the Russians who caused them to surrender, and not us. Okay, case closed. <laughs> not clo not <laughs> closed. <laughs> won't, won't be closed. Let me shift to another topic. The the. Uh, 40th anniversary of man's arrival on the moon has revived the debate about the future of the space program and human exploration of space. You have written about uh, a time when there will be extraterrestrial civilizations and space colonies potentially around the sun. Uh, what do you think the future holds and what should the U.S. space program be focusing on today? Should we return to the moon? Should we send men and women to Mars? Yeah, well, let me clarify, first of all, extraterrestrial civilizations are things that we hope are there now. It's not... Uh, I see, all right. That's not to, anything to do with us. I mean, okay. it's, <laughs> I, we, hope, we, we hope to detect them, and we hope to have some interesting conversations. But th that's not our decision, whether they're there or not. And, but the, the question is, shall we have space settlements uh, of, of humans? Uh, that's, of course, a total, totally separate question. I hope we will. But um, so let me talk about this, this the direction of the space program. I, I was lucky enough to be invited in March this year to a Russian space launch at which my friend Charles Shimoni went up and it spent two weeks on the space station. So he was launched from Kazakhstan, where the Russians have their launch center at a place called Baikonur, which essentially is a, it's a Russian city in the middle of Kazakhstan. It was the original home of the Russian space program when it was uh, before World War II. They had a, a very forward-looking space program, which then w was a rocket program, belonged to the Soviet Army, rather like JPL, which was founded at the same time, which at that time belonged to the American Army. It was uh, where all the space enthusiasts in Russia went to develop rockets, and they did extremely well, of course. And it's still their main launch center. So we saw the launch of the Soyuz launcher, which is a very lovely little launcher. It, it carries three people and takes them up into orbit. And it's very simple and rugged. So that launcher really hasn't changed much in 50 years. It's rugged and simple and it works. And it's never given them any problems. So they continue to use it. And that day when, the, when, when, when Charles Shimoni went up, it was a lousy day. It was a horrible day. It was uh, no American launch would ever have taken place under those conditions. It was, uh, it was a, a strong wind blowing over the desert and buckets of rain coming down. And uh, so we asked the Russians, well, aren't you going to postpone? And, they said, oh, no, we don't postpone. Only the Americans postpone. <laughs> so the thing went up exactly on time to, to the second. And there was no problem getting through the storm clouds. So that's the way the Russian program works. And uh, I found it very impressive that, that they have this program, which is so very different from ours in its aims and in its, its culture that uh, for, for the Russians, 
sort of space is a, is, is, is a, a matter of destiny. They, they think in terms of centuries, not in terms of decades. They're going into space. They just, they, it's a way of life, it's, it's a vocation. The, the cosmonauts devoted their lives to this. It's not for science. It's just a human adventure, but they don't think of it so much as an adventure. They think of it as a vocation. And the ceremony is quite, sort of has a religious overtones. When the day of the launch, there is a solemn parade of the cos cosmonauts, or the people who fly, and there's a solemn parade of the cosmonauts through the town of Baikonur, and they, the whole town comes out to watch them walk by, and then they stand in the town square, and they solemnly declare to the city authorities that they're ready to fly. And there is also, nowadays, there's an Orthodox priest who comes along too. And uh, you have the feeling it is, it, it, it is a, a, a sacrament in some sense, that, that they are continuing these flights into space as just as part of the human destiny. Not that any particular flight is all that important, but it's a way of life for them. Well, our, our attitude, of course, is totally different. I mean, every, every, every mission has a purpose, and we're interested in actually achieving something in the next decade. Uh, and that's uh, the, the whole spirit of our program is short, uh, short, short term in that sense, that what are we going to do in the next few years? And then after that, we can think of the next mission. But, um, and we are primarily interested in doing science as it has happened. I mean, the, 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 uh, the last 30 years, we really haven't done any exploring. The, there's been a lot of flights into the uh, shuttle flights, which have not been very exciting as human adventures. I mean, the people, of course, love to go up. And it's just as much fun for them as it is for the Russians. But they don't have the same kind of religious feeling about it for the American uh, astronauts. It's just a, 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 an adventure which they enjoy, but they are also very critical. I, I, one of my students is an astronaut who uh, talked very fr frankly about it. I mean, he said he, he, he did two s shuttle missions which were allegedly scientific, but he said it was absolutely Mickey Mouse science. There was really no real science. It was for him, it was just a great camping trip. And, and <laughs> <laughs> the, only, the only snag was it cost half, half a billion dollars each time he went up. But uh, that, that's uh, at least one astronaut talks that way, and I think a lot of them do. That in a certain sense, the, the shuttle program has lacked purpose for the last 30 years. And, the real purpose of our space program, which has been brilliantly successful and wonderful, has been the unmanned missions, the exploration of the solar system, exploration of Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune and Mars and Venus, all the planets except Pluto, and Pluto is on its way. So for us, unmanned missions have been tremendously successful and uh, also cost effective. And we've done extraordinarily well. We're still doing extraordinarily well. But the, the manned missions are a real problem because nobody really knows what they're for. And we don't have this feeling of destiny that the Russians have. So what should we do? I, I, I think myself that the Russians are showing the way and that what the, their attitude is actually the right uh, attitude. That we shouldn't be in a hurry to get to Mars. It doesn't make an awful lot of sense just to go to Mars and plant the flag and, and strut around for a few months and then come home. If we do go to Mars, we should go there with the purpose of actually settling there permanently. And it should be a real expansion of the human adventure. It should be an expansion of life as a whole, not just of human beings. So we should have larger aims in view than just planting the flag. And, and so I, I think it does. It makes sense to go to Mars if you think centuries. It doesn't make sense if you think decades. And so that's essentially the difference. So I hope we'll start to think centuries 
but uh, the idea that a Mars mission at the moment could make any kind of sense, I think, is an illusion because uh, there's really very little we could do that we would be scientifically important. And certainly, as a human adventure, it would be like Apollo. It would be un un unsustainable. It, 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 Apollo was wonderful while it lasted, but it wasn't sustained. It could not have been sustained. It was just too expensive. It wasn't cost effective. And a Mars mission would be more of the same. So it would be a, 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 a wonderful event, but it would be over, and then we would be nowhere further. So that, that's my feeling about Mars. I mean, I'd love to get there, because I, 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 when I was young and enthusiastic, I was part of Project Orion here in, in San Diego, which was a nuclear spacecraft which we hoped to build, which would have got to, to Mars in uh, roughly 1965, and uh, we didn't get to fly. So anyway, I mean, that, of course, is gone and its history has passed it by. Nobody wants to explode bombs around the landscape anymore, and I think rightly so. But uh, anyway, so since we lost that chance, we have to be patient. Our, our time is dwindling, and there are some other topics I wanted to get to. I'm sorry, so. I talked too no, long. No, 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 the time is too short. That's the problem. Um, uh, you have written about the coming age of domesticated biotechnology. Now, what do you mean by that term? Well, it's, it's my feeling that the biotechnology is likely to follow the same path that computer technology did. As I, I was there, as I'm, I'm, I have vivid memories of the beginning of computers, which happened in Princeton when, when I was a young guy. And uh, John von Neumann built the, the first computer with, with modern software. It wasn't the first electronic computer, but it was the first computer which was run by software, which of course made all the difference. And so you could program a, a, an elaborate program on software and, and do all the hard design work on, in software, and, and then the, the machine would do what you say. So he built this machine in Princeton 50 years ago, and he totally misunderstood the future of computing. He thought of computers as always being big and expensive and, and tools only for experts to use, and they would be in the hands of large institutions. So he was asked one day, how many computers will the United States government need? And he replied, 18. <laughs> he had it all calculated. But uh, of course, that was totally wrong. So what actually happened was computers did not get bigger and more expensive. They got smaller smarter and cheaper. And that's what ha has actually been the history of computers, which is still going on. Now they've become toys for three-year-olds, and, and they dominate our lives because the, our, our, our grandchildren are growing up with them. And everybody now is, who's under the age of 30 feels at home with them. and, and, and uh, so I think that's going to happen to biotech. Biotech is an equally powerful technology. It's now widely distrusted because it's in the hands of big corporations like Monsanto, and they put genes for pesticides into our foods and so on. It's a, a, it, it has a bad public image. And I think, just as computers did, I mean, von Neumann, in fact, used his computer for designing hydrogen bombs and we distrusted him too, and, and rightly so. But uh, I see biotechnology as being domesticated in the same fashion when it becomes cheap and small. And I see this happening as, as, I, as I look. I mean, it's, 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 it's happening right now. If you look at the technical devices, the hardware that now exists for reading genomes, that's uh, sequencing genomes, it's becoming cheaper and faster, just about the same speed as computers became cheaper and faster, what's called Moore's Law, which means roughly a factor of 100 every decade. 
So every 10 years, computers got cheaper and faster by a factor of 100. The same thing is true for sequences, uh, uh, sequencing genomes. And it's also true for writing genomes. So we can read and write genomes now with the same kind of speed that we can run a personal computer. Those things are getting really cheap and fast. So they're going to be available to all of us pretty soon. And uh, I got for Christmas, in fact, as a Christmas present from my daughter, not my complete genome, but a, com a complete set of SNPs. The SNPs, that means single nucleotide polymorphisms. So it's about a million places in my genome where it's different from the standard genome. And not only my SNPs our daughter gave us, but also SNPs for all our grandchildren, children, spouses, and so on. The whole tribe has our genomes already more or less done. I mean, it's not the whole genome, but it's what the part that tells you who you are. And, and so I'm, I don't have the expertise to get all the information out of this. But already I know which grandchild is most closely related to which grand, uh, grandparent. And so it's coming. I happen to know that uh, the retail price of one of these uh, a, a, a CD. You get a CD with the SNPs coded onto them, so you can read it if you if you have the expertise. Uh, the retail price of one of these things is a thousand dollars, which of course is a bit expensive. But my daughter gets the wholesale price, <laughs> which is only two hundred and fifty. <laughs> so the age of biotech, the rest of domesticated biotech, is coming pretty close. But what are the implications of that? For those well, of us who don't have those kinds of discussions around our Christmas tree, uh, explain <laughs> the implications of this advance. Well, I, feel, I, mean, I see this not applied to humans. I think it, I wouldn't want to uh, apply genetic engineering to humans. That's something I would like to, 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 to keep uh, 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 as far as possible out of the hands of, of ignorant people like me. But. Um, so I'm thinking of applying this to plants, animals, uh, particularly flowers. I mean, I think of the Philadelphia Flower Show, which happens once a year, which is the biggest flower show in the world. And you have thousands and thousands of people who come there with the beautiful things that they've done, flowers and bushes and trees that they have bred and just absolutely lovely, just roses and orchids and all kinds of beautiful things. These people are very talented and, and very dedicated. Some of them are professionals, some are amateurs. And so they have this culture of manipulating plants to make beautiful things. It's an art form which they have mastered. Well, they're still using old-fashioned technology, just breeding the plants and grafting them onto each other. They haven't yet got hold of sequencing, but they will. Well, there's also the, the reptile show in San Diego, which some of you may have seen. It's a lovely equivalent here in San Diego, because here the culture, of course, is reptiles. <laughs> <laughs> Lizards and snakes. And the, the real problem when you go with a grandchild to the reptile show is somehow get the grandchild out of the building without actually buying a snake. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so this is also in our, it's, it's, it's in human nature that children love reptiles. And uh, no doubt when genetic engineering gets into the hands of our kids, they will b produce reptiles of their own design, which will be much more exciting. and, and we will probably have little dinosaurs, and it'll be fun. And, and <laughs> it'll also be a little bit messy. And <laughs> yes, and you may be the first to have a pet dinosaur under your Christmas tree. <laughs> yes, anyway, I mean, it, it can, of course, be dangerous as well. And so we have to, we have to worry a little bit. But, but um, anyway, I do see that as very much in the future. And we have now the, to, to make the decisions. Shall we try to stop this, or shall we encourage it? That's for you to, for you to decide. Okay. Um, you're one of the few theoretical physicists who 
writes and talks about theology. I think to most people, science and religion are two separate spheres and not, uh, you know, never the twain shall meet. Uh, but in your own mind, are religion and science intertwined? Not much. I mean, the, actually, I agree with the majority that they should be kept separate. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't like those science and religion hyphen together as, as an as, as a academic discipline. That doesn't seem to me to make sense. To me, I like the metaphor of windows. I like to think of we are living in a, build, in a, we're living in a house and there's a big universe outside and we look out through two different windows. You can either look out through the science window and you see a lot of things, or you look out through the religion window and you see another lot of things, but you can't look through both windows at the same time. So that's, that's my image of, of the sort of relationship of science and religion, that they are both of them valid, they both of them are important. They certainly are both uh, consistent with each other. It's the same universe you're looking at, but you look at it differently through the two windows. But certainly science and religion have come into conflict. Uh, we think of Galileo as the prime example. Um, either the Earth is the center of the universe or it is not. Uh, was, can, can we have, can, do we not have to resolve conflicts between science and religion? No, I don't think we do. I mean, it, it's of course, uh, I, I think these conflicts, it's really Aristotle's fault. It was Aristotle who first sort of mixed up science and religion. He, he, he described very vividly the heavens as a perfect region of, of tranquility where the gods lived. And then that, unfortunately, Aristotle's works became known in the West just about the same time as the Renaissance started when the universities began in, in Paris and, and Bologna. And uh, so the first generation of Western theologians who uh, uh, read Aristotle took this as part of Christian theology. And, and so it, it became all uh, horribly mixed up. And so it was largely the fault of one man. But, but uh, anyway, it took us about a thousand years to escape from Aristotle's influence. But uh, it, so it's very unfortunate it did happen. So there was a lot of confusion and a lot of, uh, I would say just uh, uh, chauvinism of, of religious authorities claiming to, to, to jurisdiction over science and scientific authorities claiming jurisdiction over religion. And so the fault was on both sides. They both of them sort of claimed to understand everything and naturally claim into conflict. And what do you see when you look out of the religion window? I see mysteries, and I, if I look out of the science window, I also see mysteries. So they have both of them lots and lots of mysteries. So there's, there's nothing peculiar about religion in that respect. It is, uh, religion is just telling us how little we know about the purpose of things, and science is telling us how little we know about the mechanics of things. And uh, that's, that's the way it is. I mean, the interesting parts of science and not the parts that are settled, it's the parts that are unsettled. And the same is true of religion. But is the purpose in the religious sense knowable, the way the unknown in the scientific realm becomes knowable? Well, I would say that it is, of course it's different. I mean, the word knowledge has a different meaning. But on both sides, certainly you can have knowledge. I mean, we have knowledge about the purpose of the universe if we, are, if we have a, a religion of any kind, it's, it's telling us, the religion is telling us what it's all about. And, and uh, so it is knowledge of a kind. It's, it's, uh, it's, much, it's much more anecdotal. It's, it, it has much more to do with intuition than, than, than with measurement. Whereas in science, of course, it's about measurement, not, a, not, not so much about anecdotes. I would say that there's a huge middle ground between science and religion, and there stand literature and law and medicine and all kinds of other disciplines, particularly literature. Every great religion has a great literature, and that's essential. That's, I mean, so you learned about the universe through the literature 
just as much as you do through science. We have time for one last question before we go to the Q&A. Uh, and we may hear from, from uh, during the Q&A about your views on global warming, which are not exactly conventional. But I'd like to ask you whether you feel your uh, ability to inquire and to, to think freely and to probe this issue or other issues has been constrained by the criticism that you've received for your views? No, not at all. I, I, absolutely not. I mean, my situation is I used to be an expert about climate 30 years ago. At that time, the sort of the center of climate studies in the United States was the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. I used to go there regularly, and I became quite an expert on climate. Then it became politically embroiled, and, and it became also very popular. It be, be, and, and overcrowded with experts, so I, I quit. And so I, I, I stopped studying climate about 30 years ago and left it to the experts and kept out of it for the, for, for the, for the next 30 years. I kept out of it not because people disagreed with me, but I kept out of it because there were uh, too many experts and, and I wasn't prepared to keep uh, at, 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 to keep go, going to Oak Ridge, uh, and, and there were so many other places which were doing s similar things. So uh, I've never had any kind of constraint on my thinking or on my expressing my views. I kept quiet simply because I wasn't an expert, and because being 80 years old, I felt vulnerable. I mean, that uh, it's so easy to shoot me down just by saying he's an old fart. <laughs> See, I wasn't the right person to lead a crusade against the popular views about climate. And that's still true, of course. And, and so I'm not leading any crusade, but I'm still, I don't feel constrained. And on that note, I would like to say what a fascinating discussion this has been, Mr. Dyson. I wish we had another hour and a half, but thank you very much. Thank you.